Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Look at Ephesians 5.18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. See, there, there's a difference there. Drunkenness, excess in drunkenness. It is, it is a man seeking to find bliss and, and, and this feelings of emotion through, through, through excess in the world. There is a peace that comes inwardly by being filled with the Spirit in which you can speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns, singing and making melody in your hearts unto the Lord, giving. The, there, there's, a, there's a life we can have by being filled with the Spirit in which we are just in peace, content. Amen? Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. So grieve not the Spirit, be ye filled with the Spirit. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Quench not the Spirit. Is that what it says? And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is the relationship of a believer to the Spirit of God. Amen? Because you just, you just saw there that there's, there's, three, there's three different things that you can have with the Spirit of God. You as a justified believer sealed unto the day of redemption can grieve God's Spirit. You as a justified believer can be filled with the Spirit. You as a justified believer can quench the Spirit. Means, means actually actually re re resist and extinguish the Spirit of God. Amen? That's what quench means. And so, and so what I want to talk about is the relationship between the justified believer and the Spirit of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says over here in verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Ain't you thankful for that? For through him, here's the peace, for through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father. Wow. Those ain't just words on a page to me, man. What I just read there is that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died on that cross and he made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20. And by that cross, he, can, he, he has reconciled both Jew and Gentile in one body by that cross. Every Jew and Gentile, get this now, every Jew and Gentile that believes this gospel is crucified with Christ here. There is every believer today that's been crucified with Christ no longer bears that, that, that identity anymore. But Christ has taken two and made of twain one new man. And through him, through Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile today by one spirit have access unto the Father. And so Jesus Christ having made peace through the blood of his cross reconciling both Jew and Gentile in one body by the cross has given me access by the Spirit unto the Father. Look at Ephesians 2.22. I want you to see that God, God wants a relationship with us, man. And not only for us to have a relationship with Him, but for us to have relationship with each other through Him. Look at Ephesians 2.22. In whom, the in whom there is Christ, the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through what? The Spirit. See, we're talking about the Spirit. To me, the Spirit of God is not some ether mystical thing out here floating around that just comes upon me at times. Through this Spirit, I can have access to the Father. You know, I can have access to God the Father in my inner man through the Spirit. Amen. 
Y'all, y'all ever heard them old preachers say, oh, I prayed and it felt like my prayers didn't make it up above the ceiling. Y'all ever heard them say that? Well, that's not where they're going. According to that Bible, there's a spirit in you that intercedes on your behalf right now. And there's, there's something inside of you that God knows the mind of the spirit. Amen. And this, this stuff gets deep, man. But what I want you to understand is that what God, what is God doing today? He's building us together for, for his habitation through the spirit. God wants all reconciled believers to be built together in Christ to be his dwelling and his habitation through the spirit. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, I will dwell in them and walk in them. God wants to walk in you, not with you, in you. He wants to dwell in us, walk in us, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And I will be, now notice, God. He wants to be God. And he says, and will be a father unto them and they shall be my sons and daughters. You know what Paul tells you to do in light of that? He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. God wants you. God wants to dwell in you, walk in you, and he wants to have a specific relationship with you. He wants to be our God and for us to be his people, and he wants to be our father and for us to be his sons and daughters. That's a relationship. Now, when you start understanding that, this grieving of the Holy Spirit being filled, quenching, starts taking on new light, don't it? But God, God, God wants us to have a specific relationship. He put us in Christ so that we could be reconciled to Him in Christ. And that through the Spirit in Christ, we could have access unto the Father through Him. And He wants us to be built together as His habitation. This is the great mystery, guys, of the New Testament. Right? When I say great, great mystery... Paul said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 1 Timothy, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What, what Paul's talking about there, the great mystery of Ephesians is the body of Christ. Two becoming one through love and submission. The great mystery of 2 Timothy, of 1 Timothy, deals with the house of God, the mystery of godliness, which is the church of the living God. You know what the body of Christ is being built together for? To be the house of God, his dwelling through the Spirit. Amen? These are the great mysteries. And so, so understanding this, that God wants to be in a specific relationship with us, we don't get to tell God how we're going to relate to Him. We don't get to tell God who He is to us. He says, I want to be your father and I want you to be my sons and daughters. I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. I want to dwell in you and walk in you. Amen? And so... God wants to have a, but this relationship is only fully achieved through the Spirit of God. And there's so much supernatural, superstitious, religious nonsense about the Spirit of God that is unbiblical. Name me five things of the Spirit. Christian world, they all want to talk about it. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Name me five things of the Spirit. Unity of the Spirit, fellowship of the Spirit, demonstration of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Guys, there are real words in a book teaching us. We don't get just fly, let it fly off the wall, man. Just 
There's, there's a specific relationship God wants to have with us, and this relationship is had through the Spirit, and that Spirit is ministered to us through the living Word of Almighty God. You cannot have a proper relationship with the Spirit of God outside of this book. If you're, if you're walking contrary to the Spirit of God in this book, you are grieving the Spirit. If you're not reading that book, or you despise somebody who is in his preaching, you're quenching the Spirit of God. You are physically resisting the Spirit of Almighty God. Will it ever? No. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. That's never going to change. Because God is not a liar. If we believe not yet, He abideth faithful. You are sealed in that sp by the Spirit unto the day of redemption. But why would you want to spend your Christian life grieving the Spirit of God that sealed you in Jesus Christ unto that day? Now, this indwelling, this relationship God wants to have, let's look at how it actually works instead of just shouting talking points. That's what religion does. Talking points. Here's the five verses that make up my talking points. And anybody that goes contrary to that, you just got a bunch of tutors and governors in modern Christianity. A lot of men that want to lord over your faith and have dominion over your faith. So I want you to see how it actually works. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The brethren will be in, in agreement with me up to a certain point, and then they'll drop me like a bad habit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or what? Does he say Gentile or Greek there? Jew or Gen Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And so this body of Christ, this body of Christ is being formed by a baptism of the Spirit of God. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You don't belong to unto Christ as a member of his body. You're not in Christ. You're not a part of the body of Christ if you have not the spirit of Christ. Amen? It's by one spirit we get. You can get dunked in water 1,700 times, guys. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not in the body. You can hail Mary and confess and snot and snort and cry and whine about it all you want to. God chose us the salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. That's how God chose you to salvation. You don't get to make up your own way. God saves us through setting us apart by the Spirit of God and belief of the truth. That's what sanctifies us. Christ said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What sets you apart and sanctifies you and makes you holy unto God is you know His word. Amen. So by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. What does that, how does that happen? Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. I, lo I, I, I love this verse for one reason. If it was a multiple choice test, you only get two choices. And so this knocks out, this knocks out. This knocks out major denominations of Christianity today. How does a Pentecostal say you get the Spirit? Coming up here, snotting and snorting around and begging and pleading until finally God gives it to you. Look at what Paul says. This only what I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. You got, you got a 50-50 shot. It's a coin flip, man. Amen. Galatians 3 2, y'all see it? Water baptism wasn't an option. Prayer wasn't an option. You got, you got two, Paul gave you two choices of how you got the Spirit of God. You either got it through works of righteousness by the law or you got it through the hearing of faith. 
I know how I got it. So by one spirit are we all baptized into one body? Well, how do we get that spirit? Through the hearing of faith. Right? Look at Ephesians 1.13. And it ain't just simply... I, a guy told me one time he believed you'd get saved by believing anything in the Bible. If you just believe... I mean, I, I agree a man's got to believe that book's the Word of God, man, but it's... Listen, you can't just go over there and believe... Uh, uh, Jacob begat, you know, this one. Oh, I'm saved now. I, there's some, there's some, there's some hair. There's some, man. There's some, there's some screwballs in this world. I'm telling you. Now, Paul, Paul said you got it by the hearing of faith. Remember back in Romans when Paul said, Paul said they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Paul said, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. Faith comes through hearing. How does hearing come? By the word of God. But in the context, Paul's speaking specifically to the report of the gospel. And so when Paul says here, and when he's asked the Galatians, how did you, the whole context of Galatians is the gospel of Christ. Look at Ephesians 1.13. In whom you also trusted after that you what? Heard. The word of truth. What word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. In whom also, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Y'all got it? Let me show you how that thing works. Gospel. Faith. Spirit, body. Tell me I'm wrong. Hear the gospel, believe the gospel, receive the spirit, you're in the body. That's how it works. That's biblical. I just gave you three verses that shows why I believe what I believe. That's what God is doing today. He is, he is creating this body, this new creature in Christ through the Spirit. And the way you get into that is by hearing the gospel, believing it, receiving the Spirit, then you're in the body. Right? Every person that's in that has been baptized into that man's death. This new man has been crucified on a cross. You're not Paul Lucas anymore. You're not Ryan. You're not Russell. You're not Gary. Amen? You're this, you're this new man. That new man died, was buried, and rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And every person that receives this spirit and is baptized, Paul says, do you not know that everyone that was baptized into Christ was baptized into his death? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The, once you're in here, the old man is crucified. He's gone. This is why people can't understand eternal security. I had an old Ruckmanite preacher, old, old Joe Banks one time looked at me and he said, you know why people can't get eternal security, brother? I said, why? He said, because they don't understand that circumcision of Colossians chapter 2. You are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. If you circumcise a man, guys, I don't care how much you want to, you can't never put that foreskin back on him. That is a seal of righteousness. The moment I put off the old man by the circumcision of Christ, man, I'm forever sealed in this new man. You couldn't put the old man back on me if you had to. I have a seal of righteousness through faith. When Abraham believed God, God sealed him. Said, boom, circumcised. When I believe, God circumcised me in Christ. 
My old man is forever gone, forever dealt with at Calvary's cross. Amen. Amen. And the moment that happens, every person in this body is quickened, raised, and seated in the heavenly places as a member of this new man. Where's your old man? Where's your new man? That's what you're a part of now. Every, every believer, babe in Christ, man that's been saved 40 years, you don't get any more into this body. But what you have to learn how to do is how to live out this life in this new body. Not the way the old man worked. Is that a, y'all understanding this? That's, your, that's who you are now. We are a new creature created by God in Christ Jesus, man. If y'all don't run, I'm about to. I got enough Baptists in me, man, to still run and jump, do flip-flops, man. I'm telling you. When I think about this, man, I know who I was. Y'all ever read Psalms? I read, I read 40 Psalms the other morning, man. I went through 40, 40, oh, first 41 chapters of the book of Psalms, man. Something I need more in my life, man, is, is not studying to, to teach. Man, I need more personal just reading in my life. I read Psalms. I wasn't looking for the Antichrist. I was, I was just reading them. And, man, I just started reading down through there, and David, David cries out and says, God, don't remember the sins of my youth. Man, I've been there. I've, I'm ashamed of things I've done as a young man. But how many times did David say, God, let me not be ashamed for I hope in you. <sighs> Boys, that, a, oh, that ain't our mail. You better go over and read them things. Paul said, speak to yourselves in Psalms. Those things are, are a man's personal relationship with a holy God and how that old sinner David could have a reason to hope and trust in God and His righteousness. Amen. I think about those things, man, how God took that old vile man that I was and crucified him there and then quickened me and raised me and seated me as a part of this new man. And because of that, Paul wants us to know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power. You in this new man now have hope, riches, and power in Christ. Wow. And all I want is believers' eyes to be enlightened. And for whatever reason, I get criticized for that, attacked for that, brutalized for that. Here's what this thing looks like. We ain't nothing without Jesus Christ. I've, tell, I'm, I've been telling people here lately, man, the divine revelation, the, the great revelation of, of that Bible is not right division. It's not who wrote the book of Hebrews. It isn't, was Cornelius in the body? I don't care what a man's been dead for 2,000 years was. Let God and Cornelius worry about God and Cornelius. I ain't worried about Barnabas and Silas either. You know what the great revelation of that Bible is? Christ in you, the hope of glory. When God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me. God called me to reveal His Son in me. Now do you know why Paul says that I may apprehend that for which I'm also apprehended of Christ? Why was Paul apprehended? To reveal God's Son in him. I don't want to know anything else except Him. That man is the head of that body that God is creating. Now down here on this earth, throughout time, 
There's been many people to hear and believe that gospel. Right? When they heard and believed that gospel, they become a member of Christ's body. Amen? By one spirit. That's how you get in. If you don't have that spirit, you're not part of Christ. Amen? Right there. That's how the body of Christ is. It's a body with many members. Y'all understand that? The one thing we all have in common, that right there. We've been made to drink into one what? Spirit. And by that spirit, we've all been baptized into this one body. Paul says, one spirit, one body, one hope, one Lord, one faith. I got tired of writing the word one. <laughs> one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. Right? Now up to this point, the brethren's going to be like, Amen, amen, I, yeah, I agree with every bit of that. But when it comes time to walk worthy of this, they don't want to talk about it. They want to teach all the positional Greatness of being in Christ. But when it comes time to walking worthy of where God has put you, they don't want to talk about it. This is what Paul's telling you to walk worthy of in Ephesians 4. Amen? You see, there, there's a problem with that picture I just drew. And this is how I know people are selfish. See that member right there? It's in Christ. Me, 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 me. You know the problem with that picture? All those members are in Christ, but they're not joined together. You with me? Didn't Paul tell the Corinthian church that there be no divisions among you? but that you be perfectly joined together in one mind and in one judgment, all speaking the same thing. Isn't that what he said? Well, when the, when, the, when the body of Christ is not like that, what's wrong? I know exactly what's wrong. Carnality. Wisdom of men. Walking as men. The Spirit of God is not creating the division and the confusion today. Men are. And I'm telling you, man, if you're going to maintain that unity that Paul writes about, you know what you have to have as a member of that body to maintain this, uh, uh, this unity? you got to have a little bit of meekness, lowliness of mind, long-suffering, and forbearing of others in love. Not nitpicking every little thing. And I'm not talking about, listen man, I'm not talking about being completely tolerant. Guys, there's not a single member in that body that knows it all. It, it, it's like, just, just, take a, just take a brother in Christ. Believes justification correctly, sanctification, understands this body of Christ, the mystery of Christ, and all, all everything, and then says, I don't believe in the gap. And I'm like, Ugh. You keep that attitude up, and you're going to be by yourself in a corner one day. Paul says, whereunto we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule and by the same thing. You don't let what we've not yet attained to that's what Paul's writing about in Philippians. Yes, I'm seeking to attain. Yes, I'm seeking to apprehend. But where we've not yet attained to, we can't let what we've not yet attained 
destroy and tear apart what we have attained unto. You got a lot of men out there that will not read and study Philippians and understand what Paul's talking about, about nothing being done in strife or vain glory. Paul's writing from prison and you know what he said? He said, Christ is preached and I rejoice. He didn't care if he was over in the corner somewhere, shut off from the ministry, locked up in chains. He said, man, if me being locked up has caused more men to preach in Christ, I'm willing to die to magnify Christ in my body. Because that's who it's about. Not that, 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 or that. It's about Him. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Everybody can talk about the body of Christ. Well, not everybody. A lot of the brethren talk about the body, the body, the body, the body, the body, the body. But Paul tells us we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Sometimes I think Christians are looking for more reasons to fight than they are to be unified in Christ. Amen. You know the majority of the world is still debating on how a man even gets into that. A lot of Christians don't even know they're in that. A lot of Christians have never even been taught about this baptism I just gave you. They're still arguing how a man gets to heaven. And then the people that do get this foundational knowledge of what God is doing today in creating this body, when you start talking about endeavoring to keep the unity of it, you got all this talk about the body of Christ, but look at Ephesians 4, 12. How come, how come nobody talks about that one? Ephesians 4, 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of what? The body of Christ. Everybody wants to talk about the body, but nobody wants to talk about its edification. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a what? What is the edification of the body? To bring all of its members into perfection in Him. That's the ministry. Lady, lady, I'm going to tell you the kind of snakes we got in this world. Brother Dave Morgan, y'all met him, he's been here. Brother Dave does a, a Facebook live with some people in the Philippines. And this woman went, went out, snuck in there into their group and started saying, y'all need to quit, y'all need to be aware of Paul, Lucas, and Dave Morgan. Troublemaking woman. What a godless woman. Remember I talked to y'all Sunday morning about wicked and unreasonable men. Remember that? In the context of Paul saying pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. Somebody's snaking and slithering around trying to hinder the free course of the word of the Lord as an unreasonable and a wicked person. And her argument was he, they believe in edification and that you have to learn and obey or you're going to suffer loss of things in heaven. Amen. If that's what I stand accused of, then I stand guilty. Because Paul taught the same thing. Take heed how you build thereupon. Take heed in your edification. Take heed in how you build up this building of God. I'm not seeking to present God with a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble when I get there. I'm ministering His Word so that I can present Him something of value in that day. And, and while we're on the subject, yes, I believe in edification. Yes, I believe in learning the Word of God. And yes, I believe in obedience. Obedience of faith. That you may prove that good 
God wants us to be able to prove what is acceptable to Him. But just think of the, of the ridiculousness of that to begin with. If, you don't, if, you're, if you're calling me out for believing in edification, learning, and obedience, what does that mean you believe in? Destruction, stupidity, and disobedience. But she'll go, she'll go cheerlead for one of her preachers, one of her tutors and governors. It's like I said here Sunday morning, quit trying to prove or disprove me and prove yourself. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Don't, don't be looking for a proof of Christ in me. Prove yourself. Amen. Nobody wants to deal with the edification of this body. Paul speaks of the perfecting. Notice what he says there. The perfecting of the who? Saints. There they are. You know what, you know what that means? God wants each and every one of these members to be perfected. For the work of the ministry. As you grow up, guess what you have? You have something to minister to the other body, to the other members in the body. Amen? The perfecting of the saint is for the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is for what? The edifying of the body of Christ. God wants each one. Now watch how Paul says it works. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by cunning craftiness and slight of men whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but by speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things from whom the whole body is fitly joined to what? Together. Without that edification, the body of Christ is just a bunch of carnal babes. That are in him, but they're not perfectly joined together. Amen. And the only way the body of Christ can be brought into this perfection is for the members to be perfected. The perfecting of the saints. And as you grow up in Christ, as I grow up in Christ, you grow up in Christ, guess what that means? There's a joint here between me and you. And you supply to me, and I supply to you. And through that supply in the measure of every part, there's a measure here, measure here, measure here. I'm taking my measure, giving it to you. You're taking your measure, giving it to me. You know what's happening? Not only are we fitly joined together, but we're compacted now. We're just growing closer and tighter and closer and tighter. And as this happens, the body is increasing unto the edifying of itself in love. A self-edifying body. Operating in the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, oh, what ridiculous heresy. You know. Now... That perfecting of the saints there, your perfection is through the same process by which you receive the Spirit. He that ministereth the Spirit, how doeth he it? By the works of the law or by the hearing of what? So how's the Spirit minister to you? The same way you received him. How are you going to be perfected? The same process here. The Word of God through faith ministering the Spirit edifying that body that you're now part of. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith. Now I want to talk about the Spirit for just a few minutes, guys, and we'll get out of here. Y'all all, the Spirit of God is a main subject in Christianity. Would y'all agree with that? Amen. Kenneth Copeland talks about Him. Benny Hinn talks about Him. I mean, people, people, people think the Spirit of God is coming out of Benny Hinn's breath, you know. <laughs> You know, 
If people were, listen, listen, if people were reading their Bible, people like Benny Hinn couldn't fill up, couldn't fill up a, a, my living room with people. It's, what I'm saying is people just use words, spirit, spirit, spirit. We're going to let the spirit lead this morning. You know? What does that even mean, bud? Going to let the spirit lead and you're lucky if an hour and a half they've even opened the Bible yet. That's the leading of the spirit? Or are you being led by carnal flesh? Man gets up, picks a banjo for an hour and a half. Oh, people dance and clap. And then, oh, we had such a wonderful service tonight, we're not even going to preach. I, I grew up in that stuff. I didn't grow up in it, but I've seen that stuff in southern West Virginia my whole life. These silly, these silly Pentecostal people, man. They just think every little emotion or every little thing they feel is the Spirit of God. But I'm telling you, the Baptists don't fare no better than the Spirit of God. People can use the phrase, but they can't talk intelligently about what the Spirit of God is or what He's doing. And there's no reason for it, man. For example, Romans 8, 2 calls Him the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You know what that Spirit is? It's the life that is in Christ. Meaning... If that thing is functioning and operating in me, I'm not dead anymore. He's called the Spirit of God in Romans 8 9 and the Spirit of Christ in Romans 8 9. It's called the Spirit of Adoption in Romans 8 15. Interesting about that is it's referred to as an, as an it in 8 16. The Spirit itself. Okay. <laughs> you better, you better, you better. When you're, when you're in that book, man, you better buckle up. Take your time. And actually let God teach you something. He's called the Spirit of the living God in 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Now this gets into a temple. All throughout humanity, people have built temples to gods. The Egyptians, the Greeks, the Jewish people even built a temple for the God of Israel. When you read that there about the spirit of the living God, that, we are, that our hearts are being written upon with, with the spirit of the living God, the heart is the seat of our motions. Do you know why God is being, that why our hearts are being written upon with the Spirit of the living God? So that we can manifest God in this image we're in. We are to be, we are to be a temple that houses the living God. People ought to be able to see the Spirit of God and the life of God in us. Without that life, you know what we are? We're a dead idol. This is what Paul's talking about. That we're being changed into that same image from glory to glory. In Galatians 4, 6, the Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of His Son. Ephesians 1, 13, He's referred to as the Spirit of Promise. That's who he is. What about him? Well, he's called the spirit of truth in John. Paul speaks in Romans 8, 5 about the things of the spirit. They that walk after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. Things of the spirit. Do you know them? I'm not jumping on anybody. Just quit, quit running around here in your imagination about the Spirit of God. It's not a figment of our imagination. We don't follow cunningly devised fables. 
There are things of the Spirit. Paul speaks in Romans 8, 27 of the mind of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4, he talks about demonstration of the Spirit. In Galatians 3, 14, he refers to the promise of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22, he talks about fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians 4, 3, unity of the Spirit. We just talked about it. Ephesians 6, 17, sword of the Spirit. Right here. Do you know what I don't need to do? I don't need to take five minutes of my time to make a video refuting anybody. Right there is the sword of the Spirit. You preach that book. Be faithful to that book. That book will do all the cutting and dicing and slicing it needs to do. Seven and a half billion lies in the world. Guys, I don't have time to refute all of them. And, then I, and, it, and even if I did, would you still know the truth or would you just know everything you've been lied to about? Men debate because they like it. Men debate because it feeds their ego and their pride. No, not you, me. Me, not you. You're wrong, I'm not. Look at me, 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 I'm right. I can refute you, I'm better than you. That book will do all the correction and reproving that you need it to do. Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and, and everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Y'all follow me, man. There are things of that spirit. There's a mind of that spirit. There's a demonstration of that spirit. And you don't demonstrate the spirit by putting on display a carnal, fleshly wisdom of man. Paul said, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech, but in demonstration of the Spirit. I see, a lot of def I see a lot of demonstration of man's wisdom. I see very little demonstration of the Spirit of God in the world that I live in. There's a promise of the Spirit. There's fruit of that Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith. There's a unity of the Spirit, a sword of the Spirit. Paul speaks of the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He speaks of the fellowship of the Spirit in Philippians 2.1. This fellowship of the Spirit is connected to tender bowels of mercies and all these other things. He speaks of the power of the Spirit, the love of the Spirit. And he speaks of sanctification of the Spirit. And the Bible fully educates you in what the Spirit of God is doing today. Freeing us from the law of sin and death. Y'all believe that? Y'all believe this Spirit of life in Christ can free you from the law of sin and death? Or that it has freed you from the law of sin and death? How many of y'all believe that this dead body of sin can be quickened by that Spirit? How many of you believe that the Spirit can mortify the deeds of your body? I just don't know how to overcome sin. I don't know how to overcome sin. That Spirit can put to death the deeds of your body. This is what the Spirit of God does. In Romans 8, 16, that Spirit bears witness with our spirit as to our standing in Christ. The Spirit of God today is bearing witness to you that you are a child of God, meaning every preacher trying to convince you you're not really saved or that you're not a child of God or anything, guys, you can go ahead and say, that ain't the Spirit of God. Paul wouldn't tell you that, guys. He wouldn't say you've not received the spirit of bondage to, again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He wouldn't be teaching you that if it wasn't possible for you to receive another spirit. What he's telling you is reject that spirit of bondage at, at impact, man. Don't have nothing to do with it. God's spirit today is bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
The Spirit of God is a witness to us of our standing in Christ. Later in Romans 8, He's a helper of our infirmities. So the Spirit of God is doing two things in the believer today. Bearing witness to His standing and making intercessions as it pertains to His state. Because yes, you're a child of God, but you're living in the present time of suffering. Waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. And the Spirit of God is bearing witness to us at this present time that we are God's children and He's making intercession for us according to our infirmities at the present time. Three things are groaning at this present time. The creation, the sons, and the Spirit. You need to understand where you are. Right? And so, and so when He talks about this work of the Spirit, guys, it's all through there. He is teaching us the deep things of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. He's baptizing all believers into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He is changing us through this ministration of the New Testament. He is changing us and, and glorifying us, transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. He is ministering life and righteousness through the New Testament. As you're re- right here, we got the gospel. As you, as, you, as you receive that New Testament through faith, you are receiving righteousness and life through this Spirit. He is perfecting us in Christ, Galatians 3.3. 3. He is producing fruits of righteousness in us. He is producing life everlasting. I promise you, if you sow to that spirit, you will of that spirit reap life everlasting. Be not weary. He is sealing us in Christ, giving us access unto the Father, strengthening our inner man by the riches of glory, unifying us in Christ, edifying us in the body of Christ. That's what the Bible teaches about the Spirit of God. You realize how long it would take me to teach through every one of those? I'm giving you an overview of it. These are the things of God's Spirit, what He's doing. These are the things that are going to become reality and effectual in you through the Word of God. Now you as a member in this thing, that Spirit right there can be grieved. That was the point of all this. Well, how could we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? By not sowing to the Spirit for one. That would be more of quenching him. But if you, if you sit down here and you're walking after the flesh, who are you grieving? You can walk after the flesh or walk after the spirit. If you're walking after the flesh, what's happening with the spirit? You think he's grieved? If the spirit of God wants us to speak truth, every man with his neighbor and you're lying, what do you think is going on? If the Spirit of God wants you to be kind and tender-hearted one to another and you're full of bitterness and wrath, what do you think is going on? Amen. Amen. You're grieving that Spirit. The Spirit of God is, he's got a, the Spirit of God is doing a work. If you, if you refuse to put off the old man which is corrupt and put on this new man which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness, what are you doing to the Spirit of God? If the Spirit of God is wanting to transform you into that glorious image of Jesus Christ and you're, you've been 40, 50, 10, 15 years and you won't pick up the book, you're not changed, you're not being transformed, what's going on between you and the Spirit of God? 30 years into it, you're still going, I hope I'm saved. You think they don't grieve God's spirit? Amen. Amen. Well, what's the second option? Be filled. And the evidence of that feeling, guys, is an inner relationship with the Spirit of God. We worship God in spirit and in truth. When that spirit has revealed to you the truth of God, your inner man can't do anything but rejoice and give thanks unto the Father, regardless of what's going on around you. The spirit of God so strengthens our inner man that we come to a place of all long-suffering and patience with joy 
giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Man, just an inner, just an inner wonder and marvel at the things of the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Singing in your heart, making melody in your heart to the Lord. This poor man cried unto the Lord and he saved him out of all his troubles. That's what David said. Amen. There was a psalm over there where David, David thought, David thought there's no way God can have mercy on me. Nevertheless, how be it? I wish I could quote the psalm to you, man. Have you been there? There's no way God can save and love a man like me. And God has shown that his grace is exceeding abundant. And the longer I'm in it, the more my inner man just says, God, I love you. God, thank you. Thank you. God, I love you. I am what I am by the grace of God today and nothing more. And as you're filled with that spirit, not only are you going to have that inner man rejoicing and giving thanks unto the Father, but you're going to be submitted one to another in the fear of God. It's not going to be a selfishness anymore. It's going to be this, this submission in the love of Christ to the body. Amen? Last thing, you can quench it. You can quench it. To grieve the Spirit of God is to know all this stuff. Walk contrary to it. Right? Be filled. You know, you know a believer can quench the Spirit? Paul says don't do it. If, you, if it couldn't be done, then why would he say don't do it? Amen. You say, what, what is an example of quenching the Spirit of God? good example of, of quenching the Spirit of God was, would be you haven't read the Bible in six months. I would say every day, but I don't want to be that harsh on you. Or, or you won't attend. How many of y'all believe that God wants the members of this body? And I got them in my family. I'm not jumping on anybody. How many of you believe God wants the members of this body coming together? Supplying to one another. Singing with one another. Hearing others' testimony concerning what God has done for them. Right? Loving each other. We all need it, man. I need to be better at it. But having tender bowels towards each other. Weeping when one weeps. Brother Dave just lost his mother. And I, I, I know that it was coming. He knew it was coming. But now that I've lost a dad, I have more sympathy and compassion in that situation. I haven't lost my mother yet. Losing my dad was rough. But now that I've went through that and God taught me how to rejoice in sorrow and have hope in sorrow, I'm now... I can now supply that to somebody else. Whether we are comforted, it is for your salvation. Or whether we be afflicted, it is for your salvation. Everything God turns to our salvation. Don't quench the spirit, man. Where that body is, that's where the spirit is. Amen. Read your Bible. Gather together with the saints. Amen? And another way of doing it is despise. Paul says, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Amen? There are people out in this world, guys, they don't read their Bible. Everything they believe, they've learned from a some, some quick fly by night, give it to me fast. Guys, this is a work that's being done by the Spirit of God day by day until we leave out of this world, and it ain't going to stop. I don't care if you got, I don't care if you went to a Bible Institute for 15 years. It ain't over. Everybody wants this, this fast food, give it to me, give me this system. And they get these little talking points of the system. 
This ain't a system. This is a, this is a life. Hey Amen. This is a spirit that is working in us to produce this new creature for God that's been ordained unto good works. Hey Amen. And what people do is when one of these members get that written on their heart and try to share it with others, you have members in that body that despise it and quench it because it goes against a system they thought they knew. Amen? And then what they'll try to do is put a label over you. Paul, Apostle Paul believes to do evil that good may come. Paul said, your damnation is just. That's what they're going to do. There are people out there that want to tell you what I believe. I've been studying that Bible 20 years of my life. There ain't, there ain't a person in this world that's going to be able to sum up what I believe after 20 years of studying my Bible with a sentence. Amen? You know what people like that are doing? They're actively fighting against the work of the Spirit of God in hindering the free course of the word of the Lord. Amen. Any questions on any of this? Yeah, I mean, here's, here, here's how you bring it back, Ryan. That's, 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 that's it. That's it. If, if that Bible, and it's, it's been in my life, guys, and I, I know the effects of it. We all got flesh, man. It's, it's a lot easier to not pick that book up than it is to pick it up. That is a, that is a wearisome thing, man. There, there, there'll be two, three, four days. I don't pick it up. I only go in there to study it when it's time to get a message ready. I'm not personally reading it for my own life, for my own inner man. Within three to four days, I can start telling the difference in my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, the way I'm responding to people around me. I might get snappy, rude. When I'm in that book, the way I'm supposed to be like in that book, there's a difference in me. I'm being filled with the Spirit. That's the difference between being filled and being quenched. And, 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 and guys, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to do what I'm telling you to do. Anybody read. Just read. There'll be something that'll jump out at you eventually. <laughs> you know. But over time, the Spirit of God teaches us things, guys, and it's... Uh, but yeah, Ryan, don't, don't think that quenching the Spirit is like you forever put him out. It's just Paul speaking of the opposite of being filled. To quench him means that you're, you're, not, you're, you're not, if the Word of God operates, if the Spirit of God operates through the Word of God in faith, well, two things are going to quench the Spirit of God. Not having the Word of God in your life or not believing it. And so th there are people in the body of Christ that are not reading the Bible and they're not believing it when it's ministered to them. And so what they're doing is quenching that spirit. They're actively resisting the spirit of God. Make sense? And it can all be over like that if they will just acknowledge the truth. That's, that's be, and, and be recovered as Paul talks about. Yeah, so don't think he, he's like, he leaves you and he's gone and, Amen. Go ahead, Elizabeth. I just wanted to say what's been in me for 50 minutes gives me more uh, peace, confidence, and boldness to appear in spite of how I get it. Amen. Thank you for that. S stuff like that is why I keep going in the face of all the, I don't know, man. One person like you saying that is worth 50 people telling me they hate my guts. Amen, it really is. I would do this for one person. Amen, I mean, we, we are called to part. You know, I, I used to not understand the sufferings of Christ, and now I do. 
When, when you have that love of Christ and that heart of Christ in you, I can, just, I can honestly stand up here and tell you guys, I'm not, I don't know everything. I can be wrong. But what I can tell you is that my motive and my conscience and my heart, I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. I don't handle the word of God deceitfully. What I want to do is manifest the truth and commend myself to every man's conscience in the sight of God and to only make known what God has made known unto me by his spirit. Will I mess up? Yes. Will I be wrong on some things? Yes. Amen. But it's hard to have that kind of motive. Ryan knows it, man. I get on Zoom calls and I'll get on there at 8 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm still on there answering questions. Now, if you think that's a bad motive or that I don't have a heart, and then when you you have that kind of heart and that kind of conscience and that kind of motive for people, and all they can do is spit in your face and ridicule you and talk about you behind your back and everything else, man, I understand what those sufferings, and I'm not even, that's just, that's not even one one millionth of that man's sufferings. But I have to endure it if I'm going to minister these things. Amen. All right. Any other questions before we close? Y'all pray for Brother Bill. And uh, really, I love that man. It's one of my. I don't. I don't say this to be a, a Debbie Downer, but Bill's getting up there, and I worry about that all the time. I'm going to miss him. If the Lord don't come, I'm going to miss him. Amen. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings of life, God. We thank you for this church. I thank you for each and every individual in it here in it tonight, Lord. And those that couldn't be here, Father, like Brother Dave and the loss of his family and Brother Bill battling a heart issue tonight and Brother Lane sick and just all the others, Father. We pray for him. We pray, God, that your grace would, would strengthen them in times of weakness that they would realize that they already have everything in you and that, that nothing, nothing in the present time is going to be able to separate them from the love of God that is in your son Christ. And God, I pray, God, that you would uh, just strengthen this church, edify it, bring us all together into that perfect man that we may minister to one another and to all men out and abroad. And God, we just thank you and praise you for all that you do in the holy and precious name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.